Hi everyone, welcome to part 2.5 of Understanding Series Convergence. Today we're just going to be focusing on the integral test and we're going to work through some practice examples of using the integral test. Because I don't feel like I did the integral test justice in part 2. Because I kind of gave a brief explanation and then used really easy examples to justify the P-series test. So that's why we're doing a part 2.5. I'm going to give harder examples that will require us to use the integral test. So, just to recap, the integral test tells us that if we have a function like f of x and we set that equal to an infinite sequence a sub n, we can, as per usual, take the integral or the area under f of x. Now, I understand these rectangles aren't very good. Now, how can we actually do this estimation? Well, that's where the infinite series comes into play. We can argue that the infinite series or the series from, let's say, 1 to infinity of a sub n we could say that that's a rectangular approximation with a delta x of 1. Okay, there we go. Delta x of 1. And we can say that this is the series of f of x sub n times delta x. And as you know here, this is what we call a Riemann sum. And we can take the limit of this Riemann sum and turn it into an integral. So, therefore, we can say that an infinite series and an improper integral from 1 to infinity, or whatever to infinity, they will behave in the exact same manner. So, if the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx converges or diverges, then the series from 1 to infinity of a sub n will converge or diverge exactly how f of x, the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx does. So, if the integral converges, the series converges. If the integral diverges, the series diverges. So that's pretty much the rundown of the integral test. Now let's go ahead and get into some examples here. So starting off with this first one, we have the series from 1 to infinity of n over n squared plus 1. You've probably seen this in the last part we did, and we said that this had, uh, this had an inconclusive result for the test for divergence, or the nth term test. But we are actually going to get a result this time with the integral test. So let's go ahead and let f of x equal x over x squared plus 1. And I actually forgot to mention, there are three conditions we need to fulfill in order to be able to use the integral test. In that graph I showed, we could have used the integral test. Why? Because every point was positive, it was decreasing, and it was continuous. So just remember that. Whenever you're doing the integral test, if the function is not positive, or decreasing, or continuous, you cannot use the integral test. It will not work. So. Let's get back to this. So we have the function f of x, this is equal to x over x squared plus one. We know that this is gonna be positive because x squared plus one is always positive and x from one to infinity, that's always gonna be positive. This is gonna be decreasing because x squared plus one outgrows x. And of course, this will be continuous. There's no point of, there's no value of x that will make this graph not exist. So we can go ahead and use the integral test. So we take the integral from one to infinity of f of x dx, that's going to be x over x squared plus 1 times dx. For notation purposes, we write this as the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of x over x squared plus 1 times dx. Now, for this integral to actually be doable, we need to do a bit of a substitution, which you might be familiar with as u substitution. So, in this case, we're going to let u equal x squared plus 1. And by doing so, we take the differential du because we want the differential to match the integrand variable. So du is 2x dx. If you notice, on the top we have an x dx, but we don't have a 2. So we can go ahead and say that x dx is equal to 1 half times du, just manipulating that equation there gives us this. Now. Whenever we're doing a u substitution with a definite integral, we need to change our limits of integration. So the way we do that is we plug in our current limits of integration into u. So we get that the new limit of integration, u initial, is going to be 1 squared plus 1, which is 2. And u final is going to be t squared plus 1. But for notation purposes, we're going to say that this is the limit as t goes to infinity of t squared plus 1. So with all this information, let's go ahead and complete the substitution. So we have a 1 half out front, 
and this is going to be times the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 2 to t squared plus 1, which are our new limits of integration. And as we said before, this becomes our u, and this x dx kind of just turns into du because we already have that 1 half there. So we're going to say that this is 1 over u times du. Now, this integral looks extremely friendly and temp, but it also looks tempting to use the power rule. Let's not do that. There's actually a rule for the integral for 1 over x dx, and that's going to be ln absolute value of x. So this gives us 1 half times, again, the limit as t goes to infinity of ln times of ln of the absolute value of u, or natural log, uh, from 2 to t squared plus 1, and we have that limit there. So this is going to be 1 half times the limit as t goes to infinity of ln absolute value t squared plus 1 minus ln 2. So as you can tell, we could of course combine these logs, but that's not necessary. As you can tell, t squared plus 1, that's going to approach infinity. ln of infinity, ln is not bounded anywhere, so it's going to be infinity. So this becomes infinity. And as you can tell, since infinity is not a finite value, this series diverges by the integral test. And now if you notice, in that first part, as I said before, when we did the test for divergence, this series gave us an inconclusive result. Now we could tell that it diverges, even though it had a limit of zero in the nth term test. So that's just another counterexample that you can tell. So moving on to the next one here. The, we have the series from 2 to infinity of ln n over n squared, or of course ln is natural log. So let's go ahead and use the integral test again. And we can actually use the integral test because it's 2 to infinity. If it was 1 to infinity, ln of 1, or the very first term, the very first term would have been 0, and the graph would have looked something like this. As you can tell, this is not a feasible graph to use for the integral test because it increases from here to here, but then it starts decreasing. That's why we have that ln2, just to accommodate for that. That way it'll always be increasing. Or, sorry, it'll always be decreasing because we can't use it increasing for an integral test. Sorry about that. So, f of x is going to be <clears throat> natural log of x divided by x squared. Again, we're going to go ahead and take that integral from not 1 to infinity, sorry, 2 to infinity of <clears throat> ln x over x squared dx. And again, this is the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 2 to t of ln x over x squared dx. Yes, okay. Now, if you're taking a look at this integral here, you can tell that we can't exactly use, we can't exactly use the u substitution technique that we did earlier. We're gonna have to use a different technique. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go ahead and rewrite this integral just so it's a little bit more visible that we need to use this technique. So it's gonna be ln x times one over x squared dx. So we call this technique here integration by parts where we have two parts of an integral and we need to integrate both of them at the same time because they're a product. So this is pretty much a reverse product rule here. We say that the integral of u times dv, where u is one part of the integral and dv is the other part of the integral, this is gonna be u times v, where u is of course the first part of the integral and v is the antiderivative of dv minus the integral of v, the antiderivative of dv, times du, which is the derivative of u. And this is can be just derived from manipulating the product rule a little bit. So we need to go ahead and establish what our u and v or u and dv are. So in this case, our u is going to be ln x because it's ex it's extremely easy to differentiate ln x, but it's hard to integrate ln x. So we're going to set that as our u. So a dv then is going to be 1 over x squared dx. And we have to incorporate that dx because dv is a derivative expression. So if we go ahead and differentiate u, we get du is equal to 1 over x dx. And notice if we go ahead and divide the dx here, 
we get du dx equals 1x, we're just multiplying the dx on both sides. That's how we get this, just to clarify that. And then, taking the antiderivative of dv, we get v is equal to negative 1 over x. And you might be tempted to add a plus c here, but we're not going to do that, because then the plus c would just cancel out, so it doesn't matter. So, we, we can go ahead and apply this integration by parts formula now. So we get that this integral right here is the limit as t goes to infinity of u times v is going to be negative ln x over x minus the integral of v, which is negative 1 over x, times du, which is 1 over x dx. And this is going to be evaluated from 2 to t. So, as you can tell, we can go ahead and simplify this integral down a little bit. So, we're going to go ahead and notice that, sorry, I already erased it, but I'm going to mention it now. We're going to go ahead and notice that that, in, that minus sign I just erased canceled with this negative sign. So, this just becomes a plus. And then, since we did a negative 1 over x times a 1 over x, this just becomes 1 over x squared dx. And we got to keep our limits of integration there, which is going to be from 2 to t. So... This is going to be the limit as t goes to infinity of negative ln x over x. And as we stated before, the antiderivative of 1 over x squared dx, that's just negative 1 over x. So this is going to be minus 1 over x, because we had a plus there. And this is, of course, evaluated from 2 to t. So then this becomes the limit as t goes to infinity of negative ln t over t minus 1 over t minus negative ln 2 over 2 minus 1 over 2. Now, let's just go ahead and take this limit. This limit's actually really easy. So, as we stated in the order of magnitude, when we mentioned that in part 0, t will outgrow ln t as t becomes infinitely large. So therefore, since t is going to outgrow ln t, t is going to be much bigger than ln t as t becomes infinitely large. Therefore, this limit right here will approach 0. And the same goes for here. 1 is not going to change, but t is going to be infinitely large. When the denominator grows bigger than the numerator by a large margin, the actual fraction itself becomes infinitely small. So this limit is going to be 0. I mean, this limit is going to be 0. So therefore, this whole limit is just 0. And we can go ahead and cancel out all these negative signs. And then we get ln 2 plus 1 divided by 2 for our answer. And I'm sorry, that's really bad handwriting on my part. But there we go. ln 2 plus 1 over 2. I just went ahead and combined the fractions. Either way, this is a finite answer. So therefore, this series converges by the integral test. All right, last one here. We have the infinite series from 3 to infinity of 1 over 9 plus n squared. Now, this one looks a little bit convoluted, and some of you college calc students might look at this and think that you need to use a trig sub for this one. We're not going to be doing that. We're just going to use a u sub, and I'll show you how. So, again, this is positive, decreasing, and continuous, so we can go ahead and use the integral test. So f of x is 1 over 9 plus x squared. If we go ahead and take our integral from 3 to infinity of 1 over 9 plus x squared dx, this is, of course, for notation purposes, the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 3 to t of 1 over 9 plus x squared dx. And now I'm going to go ahead and manipulate this integral a little bit. That way, we can maybe get some sort of antiderivative solution to this. And I'll show you how. So, you notice that we have a 9 here. This might look a little bit familiar if we have a 1. So let's go ahead and factor out this 1 9th. So as a result, we get 1 9th times the limit as t goes to infinity, the integral from 3 to t of 1 over, and now that we factored out the 1 9th, this is going to be a 1 plus, if we factor out a 9 from a term that doesn't have a 9, such as x squared, this is going to be x squared divided by 9. 
That way, if we factored out, factored back in the nine, this nine is just gonna cancel out. So we're just gonna have this. And we can change this integral one more time, giving us one nine times the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from three to t of one over one plus x over three <clears throat> squared, because nine is just three squared. Now you can kind of see where this u substitution will come into play. If we go ahead and set u equal to x over three, du is just one third dx. And of course we can go ahead and say that dx is just three times du. And remember, we have to change our limits of integration now that we're dealing with u. So u initial is three divided by three, which is just one. And u final is the limit as t goes to infinity of t over three. So we can go ahead and multiply this three back in and we get three over nines for the coefficient. That's just one third. So you get one third times the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from one to t over three, one over one plus u squared du. Now, this right here is actually an antiderivative and it's the antiderivative of inverse tangent. So this is gonna be one third times that limit as t goes to infinity of tangent inverse of u evaluated from one to t over three. So this is gonna be one third times the limit as t goes to infinity, tangent inverse of t over three minus tangent inverse of one. That's a pretty terrible looking one. So <clears throat> this limit right here, as t goes to infinity of tangent inverse of t over three, that's pretty much tangent inverse of infinity. If you remember, tangent of x is equal to sine x over cosine x. So there are some values of x that make tangent undefined. In other words, cosine of x equals zero. One of these is pi over two. So tangent pi over two, we know that's gonna be sine pi over two is one, cosine pi over two is zero, which we know as undefined, but we can fix this a little bit. We, we can go ahead and throw in a one-sided limit. So if we set the limit as x approaches pi over two from the left-hand side of tangent x, sine x is gonna approach one, cosine x is gonna approach zero from the positive side. So therefore, this is going to be positive divided by positive infinity, positive infinity. So if we go ahead and took the inverse tangent of this, an inverse tangent of infinity, that is actually just pi over two, believe it or not. So therefore, we get one third times this limit will approach pi over two minus tangent inverse of one is actually pi over four because sine pi over four equals cosine pi over four. And you can just figure that out from this formula right here. So tangent inverse of one, that's pi over four. So this is gonna be equal to pi over two minus pi over four is pi over four. Multiply that by one third. And we're going to get that this is equal to pi over 12. So pi over 12 is our finite value for this integral. And since it's a finite value, again, that means that this series converges by the integral test. And with that, hopefully you get a more clear understanding of what goes on in the integral test. Obviously, these integrals are a little bit more higher level, but these do give a good understanding of, again, what happens when you're doing the integral test. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up part 2.5, and I hope to see you in future parts. Thank you.